Okay, great. Well, thank you, April. Thank you, CDC, for having me. Uh, and welcome, everybody. I heard there was 33 or 34 registered attendees, and um, I'll have to start by saying I'm not surprised by that. Um, in my time working for Senator Feinstein for almost seven years, I represented her in a large part of Southern California, and I can tell you definitively that the Joshua Tree community uh, has always been the most mobilized and organized community that I've seen and interacted with. So I'm not surprised there's a good attendance tonight. Um, so uh, as April mentioned, I'm Chris Carrillo. I've uh, been in our county with the politics um, off and on for the past 14, 15 years. I worked for Senator Feinstein from 06 until 2012 and then moved over to be Deputy Chief of Staff for James Ramos, our county supervisor, for a few years. And I'm now a local elected on the East Valley Water District Board of Directors, and I've been on that board for about six years too. And I'm also an attorney um, with Gresham Savage here in San Bernardino. We, uh, it's one of the oldest law firms in the state and um, definitely one of the oldest in the county. And so we deal all kinds of uh, legal issues um, with countywide politics and land use and litigation and, so, um, but I want to start by saying this, all politics is local. You guys have heard that phrase. And I think this is the most appropriate forum because it doesn't matter if you're trying to tackle a federal issue, a state issue, a county issue, or a local issue with your city. It all comes back to trying to influence your local elected officials and your local decision makers. Um, I can tell you in working for the Senator, we worked on federal issues, but I spent a lot of my time working on the ground level with community leaders and with uh, mayors and city council members and you name it, people on the local level, because that's really where the change occurs. And if you're trying to reach somebody on a federal level, um, most responsible, professional elected officials at that level want to know what the local elected officials think and if they support the issue or the project. So with that said, um, I'm here, you know, again, because I want to give you a little 101 on effectuating change and how to reach your local decision maker. So let's just uh, dive right into it. Let's see here. Okay. Um, so here are a few controversial issues that I've been involved with in the past decade or so uh, that actually got across the goal line. Um, and there are issues that are familiar to probably a large part of this audience. And the first one is U.S. Senator Feinstein's California Desert Protection and Recreation Act, which I would refer to as a desert bill. Um, and that was really controversial for a few different reasons, but at its inception, it was controversial because it was being introduced back in 2009, and it was at that time largely a land conservation bill. At a time when Congress, or at least the House, uh, was Republican led. And at that time, our local elected here in our county. Um, you know, at that time, didn't want to take a meeting and, you know, wasn't as interested in carrying that legislation at that time and wanted, I think, to see more from that legislation. And so, you know, it took some time, obviously, uh, but we had two different presidents sign bills and uh, executive orders into law that accomplished the passing and enactment of that desert bill. Uh, but nevertheless, it was controversial and without the persistence and, um, without a lot of mobilization from the local community and the ground grassroots level, I don't think it really would have gotten accomplished. Uh, but we'll go into some of the reasons why I think it did. Uh, second is when I was with the county board of supervisors, um, at that time back in 2012, believe it or not, you had the largest geographic county in the continental US um, with the most sunshine of any place out there. And yet we had a largely undeveloped uh, renewable energy ordinance and renewable energy policy. Um, I remember at the time being up in Joshua Tree and hearing from people, constituents saying, well, they're building solar projects in my backyard, you know, and this is residentially zoned. And taking that back to our CEO and discovering that it's true, our, our actual ordinance, our county ordinance, our county policy at the time was silent on where you can put these projects. And so, of course, that became a hugely contentious issue because you had so many different stakeholders involved, right? You had community, um, you had you know, labor, and you had solar developers, and you had environmental groups and conservation groups. And so you had a lot of different people you know, at the table kind of duking that one out. And yet, you know, several years later, we have, I, I think I'd argue, most people would probably agree, we have a, a largely developed uh, renewable energy ordinance and general plan now. Um, 
And then finally, just here in Highland and San Bernardino, uh, the Sterling Natural Resource Center is a, a large water recycling center that's being proposed. It's currently under construction, but this is something I was involved with uh, East Valley Water District. And it was very controversial just because there was 6 million gallons of water that was being sent down to Orange County every single day that we really should have been keeping here in our local communities in San Bernardino County. Um, but, you know, there were different players at the table that they didn't want to let go of certain control and, you know, receiving a certain amount of money from the city of Highland and East Valley Water District ratepayers. And so these are three very controversial issues that I think you know, without um, the following outline here, never would have got across the goal line, but they did. And this is how it happened. Um, it all started with engaging your elected official. And what does that look like? So I talk about it in a, you need to approach your elected official in a 360 degree approach, right? You, you need to first mobilize and coalition build. Um, you need to frame your issue both publicly and then also do the behind the scenes work. And then come the time for you to actually make your pitch directly with your local elected or decision maker. And of course, at the end here, I've got persistence and patience because that's often what it takes. Um, these issues that are controversial at those levels, you know, you don't get what you want right away. Uh, if anything, you're lucky to have a compromised approach, but it definitely takes time um, and persistence to achieve those results. So let's start with uh, my big motto here is grab a seat at the table. Um, any public policy discussion is always going to be a negotiation. And it's normally between more than just two groups. It's normally not just a black and white issue. It normally involves multiple interest groups. Uh, when I got involved with the Desert Protection Act and the Desert Bill, uh, there were countless stakeholders involved. Um, and so what we always recommended, and a lot of times they're adverse with each other. And what we recommended was, look, grab a seat at the table. And you actually, you have a voice, number one, and you might be able to achieve a result that, that is within reason and within compromise. And so I think a really good example of that um, is the OHV community with the Desert Bill. Um, and that was something that historically, the OHV community and the conservation community just went at it like that typically and, and never got along. They didn't want to sit down. They didn't want to be in the same room as the others. Um, and yet through the Desert Bill, we really encouraged then to sit down and we told them, look, we have an open ear and open mind. Um, let's see what we can potentially accomplish together. And so they agreed. Most of the leadership in that OHV community agreed, not all, um, but they did. And at the end of the day, the desert bill was passed and there you know, are OHV recreation areas now that are legislatively protected that otherwise wouldn't have been um, had they not grabbed a seat at the table. And you can see the same thing with labor groups with the County Renewable Energy Ordinance. Um, and we see that where they really pushed and, and tried to be as reasonable as they could that we know there's going to be a solar moratorium. We understand that we need to hit pause on this game. But nevertheless, there are all these existing projects that are almost across the finish line. Um, when we started contemplating this you know, change in the ordinances and the general plan amendments, and they really pushed for us to grandfather in at the county level some of the existing projects. And, I know that wasn't entirely popular with everybody, um, but we felt that it kind of struck that, that um, compromise level. So, and then before I go on to the next one here, um, leave your pitchfork at home and come with a solution. And when you're approaching elected officials, come with a solution that you think they can actually carry. And that is gonna, we'll go and do it in a minute, but that actually requires that you need to do your homework on that individual and figure out where they stand on you know, policy positions like the one that you're presenting them with. And, you know, maybe your solution isn't one that they can carry for you, but maybe something just short of that is something that they might entertain. Um, and I've seen that often is the case. So it, rather than giving up, you know, have some perseverance, have some creativity and thought and be strategic in your approach. And you actually might be able to consensus build um, with other local elected officials. And we can talk about that in a moment. So let's start with mobilizing and coalition building. Um, so first off, engaging your community and what does that look like? Uh, town halls, community meetings, things like what we're all doing here this evening. Um, but it also means letters to the editor, right? Having a public presence, um, doing op-eds. Um, when you do that, you're making your issue 
known to the community, first off, um, and to elected officials who all read the papers. Um, they hear what's going on. They've got a, a good pulse on their community if they're doing their job right. And so you're showing that your issue is relevant and, and actually deserving of a public policy discussion. So that's you know, at one level. Um, this is the part here, this next step, that I think is critical. It's coalition building and meeting with relevant stakeholders to obviously find a shared interest, um, get letters of support from them, but especially take a look at those groups that may not normally align with your interest. Um, often the case, you know, if you're dealing with maybe state politics, federal politics, obviously you've got you know, Democrats and Republicans. And so if you can try to get buy-in from people, let's say if you're approaching a Republican leader or a Republican elected official, if you can show that there's, there's groups out there or community leaders out there who have an R next to their name or are typically you know, conservative in their approach and their policy positions and they actually support you in your issue, I mean, how fantastic is that, right? To walk into a room, you know, holding hands with, um, you know, people on both sides of the aisle. Um, when I work for the senator, and I feel comfortable sharing this, but um, most people don't know this about her, but she's been very, very effective in the U.S. Senate because she had kind of a policy that she would not typically introduce legislation unless it had a Republican co-sponsor and her being a Democrat. And because she knew that that was the, the most effective way to get things across the line. And so I think at your level here, anytime you're dealing with any type of issue, if you can get some buy-in with people who normally don't align with your interests, it legitimizes your cause. It shows broad support. Um, it demonstrates that you're capable of developing a compromise offer. Uh, and, you know, of course it grabs the attention of your decision maker. On the desert bill, we worked, um, you know, April and Frazier on the call here and a lot of others worked really hard at trying to persuade Republican leadership why they should get on board with that bill. And we knew that we couldn't share the message of this is great for the environment and, and only that. I mean, those leaders, I think, cared about those issues, but they also cared about economic issues. And they wanted to make sure that anything that they were going to do with federal legislation wouldn't have an economic negative impact on their communities, which is completely reasonable. And so what we did was we started approaching, you know, local tourism agencies and in developing and generating, you know, an economic message to go along with, you know, the conservation and recreation message. And, and so we started getting letters of support. Well, we first met with a lot of chambers of commerce and local business leaders and then got the local chambers of commerce to issue a letter of support. And we did that over and over and over again. And then eventually it warranted a conversation with the Cal Chamber of Commerce, right, statewide. And, and when we showed up and knocked on their door up in Sacramento, I'll never forget it, you know, we had, you know, stacks of local chambers of commerce support for this desert legislation that they otherwise never would have looked at. They never would have even, you know, really entertained it. Um, it probably would have taken a meeting because we asked for it. but we got Cal Chamber of Commerce to support the desert bill because we showed there was that economic message that was a part of it. And once we got that, we were able to leverage that letter and that support into broader support with other people on the other side of the aisle from Senator Feinstein, right? And so you can see how that, that domino effect takes place. But um, so that, you mobilizing and coalition building, I, I can't underscore enough that it is so important. This is equally important. Um, meeting with staff. Now, I'm a little biased because I spent a large part of my career in politics working as a staffer, um, but I've seen how it works. And most elected officials rely on their staff uh, for advice, for recommendations on policy issues. Uh, it doesn't mean they always agree, but it's really critical that you request a meeting with the decision makers, uh, staff, or who handles that policy issue. Get familiar with the person. Um, you know, take them out to have a bite to eat and, and get to know them, not just on a professional level, if you can, maybe on a personal level, um, to, to see what their interests are, and to, to see if they're willing to actually have an open mind to take a look at what you're proposing. Um, and, and I threw this in there as a bullet point number two, but no offense, but a meeting with the intern does not count. Um, you need it to be kind of a high level staffer uh, because they're gonna then convey your message over to their boss and to that elected official. And so when I was with Feinstein, you know, people took me out and showed me the land or they showed me the issue and I was able to go out there and touch, you know, feel and see it. And 
especially I think with environmental um, issues or projects, when you're out there walking the land, you get out of the office, you know, it, it leaves an impact on you. It, it's, it stays with you and especially with the desert. Um, and so those, those meetings and those tours of wilderness and wild and scenic rivers, uh, proposed designations and OHB areas and, um, you know, it had a real meaningful impact I can say on me and I know uh, with James Peterson as well and ultimately with the Senator, because we did that as well with her. Um, volunteer your time and offer a second meeting with the elected officials, chief of staff or deputy chief of staff if you can, uh, if you get that first meeting or a tour, um, follow up and you know give it a little bit of time but follow up and make sure that um, you also talk to the other person that's probably going to be in the ear of that elected official so once you've done those things um, you know you've done your op-eds you've done your letters of, uh, of support letters to the editor you coalition built you mobilize both publicly and behind the scenes um, you've engaged the staff right? Um, they understand what your issue is. Then you're ready for a meeting. So what you want to do is you want to draft a letter outlining your issue and requesting the meeting. And I can't tell you how many times and, and people are passionate. And so at least when I would read these letters, I mean, I read them all the way through, but I can't say that everybody I know did um, with maybe other offices. I know that if you have a 10 page letter coming at you, um, people read the first couple pages and then they kind of, if you can't get to your point within the first two or three pages, you know, sometimes that ends up in the trash. And so I'd recommend keeping it short and sweet, um, no more than two pages, request the meeting for that elected official, and then go ahead and send it off. Now, assuming that you get that meeting, now we're going to talk about making your pitch. Uh, and I want to start with valuing the local decision makers time is incredibly incredibly critical um with the senator with uh, supervisor ramos it it was the same type of thing um with the senator we had our monday morning calls and if you can imagine there's 70 staffers in her room in dc uh, in their conference room and then on the phone from california and she's talking about a host of issues from international national you know statewide and then local jurisdictional issues and so you know, and those meetings lasted an hour, an hour and a half, two hours maybe. Um, you had to be able to convey your issue and what the community that you were representing in a very effective, concise, efficient manner. Um, you know, a couple of minutes tops. Uh, memos to the senator were always, you know, two or three page memos because um, you needed to be able to get in and get out and explain the issue quickly. So I say when you're making your pitch, value their time, understand that the issue that they're going to be hearing from you that day is probably one of seven or eight, maybe 10 issues they're gonna hear just in that day. So you do the math on how many issues that is a week and a month. Um, and so it's very, very important that you're respectful of their time. Now, of course, you have to know your audience. Um, you have to know who the decision maker is, appreciate their background. And what that looks like is doing your homework, um, campaign issues that that person ran on. Um, what platform did they run on? Um, what's their background as an elected? Uh, who are their campaign donors? What were their prior public policy votes on like-minded issues or, or similar in their capacity as an elected official? How did they vote on conservation issues? Um, you know, so how were your conversations with the staff? Um, how were your conversations with that elected in the past? Um, any public comments they might have made in local newspapers? You need to do all that homework ahead of time to know your audience so that when you're making that pitch, you can be as effective as you can. And you want to focus your audience and explain the issue. You want to explain why it's important to you, but not just to you and your group, but why it's important to the broader community. And ultimately, if it is important to the broader community, it will and should be important to that local elected official as well. Um, and as I mentioned before, come to the table with a solution uh, and preferably one that that official can carry for you. So, you know, I can tell you when we were looking at Desert Bill and we approached um, Supervisor Derry and I believe it was Supervisor Mitzelfeld at the time, um, you know, great individuals and cared a lot about their community. Their politics was such that they had told us at the time, at least with that legislation in its form at that time back in 2008, 2009, that, you know, they, they couldn't support it. But they, we got them to a position where, you know, they wouldn't oppose it either. And, and that's relevant. You know, so going before the county board, if you know that 
two of the five are going to be neutral on something, well, you've got a real shot actually at passing, you know, getting a, a letter of support from the county board uh, if you can convince three. So, you know, we knew with Dairy and with Mitzelfeld that they wouldn't ever carry the desert bill for us. Um, they were never going to be a poster child for that legislation. But the fact that we were able to move them into a spot where they were comfortable enough with it to be neutral on that um, legislation it took a lot of time, but it was a, it was a real success, you know. And I think it paved the way for later support um, at that level. And then after the meeting, I know we have to be sensitive to time and I only have about 15 minutes. So um, after the meeting, you're done, right? Not a chance. Um, you've done all that work, all that pre-leg work, and you've taken the meeting, it went well, let's say, and now's the time for you to apply the full court press. Um, when I was in high school, I had a cross country coach, Coach K, and I'll never forget it. Um, and I've used this principle and I've applied it in my life and in my professional career. Um, I remember he would have us sprint at the top of running a hill. Um, so you'd be running up that hill and you're exhausted. You're just so, you feel so accomplished. You got to the top of the hill, you know, you're in your race. And then he'd be there at the top of the hill saying, okay, now I want you to sprint and give me 20 sprinting paces so you can get back to your pace before you hit the hill. And, and he was absolutely right. You know, the, the bad cross country runners or the ones that weren't so good would, would, you know, lag into a regular slow pace at the top of that hill. But, you know, our team was good at that. And I share that with you because when you're at the top of your issue, the hill of your issue, that's when you need to push on and, and sprint the hardest. And that means continuing to mobilize. It means continue to meet with other stakeholders and continue to coalition build. Um, meet with other decision makers. You know, you want to make sure that you continue to do that. At that point, you want to, now that that elected official has heard your message and your request, um, you want to push forward with the op-eds, the letter campaign, phone calls to that office and other offices. And of course, you want to follow up with the, with the staff. Um, and so those are kind of some basic core 101 principles to how to, in my opinion, um, effectuate change and how to reach your local decision maker. Um, I know that we are here today to apply some of those concepts and skill sets um, to a particular issue, which Tim uh, will go into momentarily. Um, but as a transition to my discussion here in Tim's, um, I wanted to make sure that everyone's familiar with CEQA, with NEPA, and with ESA, and you can see it here. Uh, but these are state and federal um, regulations and laws that are in place to protect, you know, impacts on the environment, on the community, on neighboring land, um, that local jurisdictions, like for example, CEQA, uh, local jurisdictions like your city council, your county board of supervisors, has jurisdiction typically uh, to thumbs up or thumbs down a project. Um, and so with CEQA and or NEPA, uh, NEPA is the federal version of CEQA, um, you're also looking at whether or not the project can be mitigated to a certain extent and then passed. So these are some of the laws that we'll be working with at today's workshop. And I want to now turn it over to Tim. Hey everybody. Um, let's see, Mariana, I'm gonna try to share my screen if that works and I'll go into my presentation. Yeah, go for it. Can you see how to do that? Is that available? Yeah. Uh, let's Perfect. see. Perfect. How's that? Looks good. Excellent. Okay. Well, uh, hello, everybody. And um, it's really my pleasure to be speaking to the CDC and to all of you um, our uh, dedicated environmental advocates in the high desert. And so um, just uh, a little more background on my own experience with all of this. Uh, I grew up on the coastal side of the mountains, but um, in my mid twenties or so, I, I actually uh, became a county planning commissioner for San Bernardino in the first district, which included all of the high desert. And uh, this is back in the mid 80s, before the city of Joshua Tree or Yucca Valley or Hesperia had even incorporated themselves. And so um, I've seen tremendous growth and change in the high desert 
as any of you have if you've been around for a few decades. Um, and that kind of uh, leads us to the focus of my talk, which will be how you can uh, apply that environmental decision making um, to this particular project that's before us imminently, that is the petition to list the Western Joshua tree as a threatened species under the California Endangered Species Act. So with that, um, in mid-October, way back in 2019, gosh, doesn't it seem like forever, um, the, uh, the Center for Biological Diversity filed a formal petition to list the Joshua tree, the Western Joshua tree, as a threatened species under the California Endangered Species Act. And um, the reasons for this would be um, several fold threatened by climate change. And there's a really good article um, that I can share with you. And I'll share this uh, PowerPoint with all of you so that you can uh, do a little further research on the various links and background information upon which this petition to list the Western Joshua tree as threatened up upon which that is based. But the primary reasons are number one, climate change. There was a study that came out just, uh, it just very recently from UC Riverside that um, modeled the impacts of increased temperature especially in the lower elevations of the desert and the fact that Joshua trees are not reproducing very well even in areas that they're protected such as within the Joshua Tree National Park and um, this these models showed that the western Joshua tree in particular uh, we would lose be losing as much as 80% of its habitat by the year 2100, if we don't do something you know, very actively to try to protect them. Um, and the other primary area of impact would be habitat destruction due to urban sprawl. And that is the, just the sprawling developments that are now the city of Adelanto and Hesperia, Apple Valley, um, Yucca Valley, Joshua Tree, uh, all the way over to Palmdale and Lancaster. Um, and so the Center for Biological Diversity issued this petition to list these species. Um, if you uh, wanna check the formal petition uh, afterwards, if uh, you have a copy of this PowerPoint, you can uh, see the actual petition. It's at this link at the bottom of my page here. Um, for uh, biologicaldiversity.org, and that's their actual petition. So they're proposing to do this under the California Endangered Species Act. The Federal Endangered Species Act, um, needless to say with the present administration, is, uh, is totally stalled with regard to listing anything. And so no action is expected on the federal side of this uh, for potentially some years uh, as they proceed to try to move a petition forward on the federal side. But on the state side, the California Endangered Species Act, we have a much more willing audience. And because the Joshua Tree is entirely within the state of California, perhaps this is um, more appropriate in any case. But the California Endangered Species Act mirrors the federal one. And, uh, and this is how they define an endangered species. So pardon me for all the verbose nature of the, and texty nature of these slides, but this is the actual language in the Fish and Game Code that is the definition of an endangered species. And that would be um, a native species or subspecies of plant or animal that's in serious danger of becoming extinct throughout all or a significant portion of its range. That is extinct, as is it won't exist anymore. 
and due to any number of causes, loss of habitat, change of habitat, etc. Okay, so that's the definition of endangered. The definition of threatened is that it's a species that, although not presently threatened with extinction, it could become an endangered species uh, in the foreseeable future if things don't change and if they aren't protected. And so that's what the Center for Biological Diversity is proposing, that the Western Joshua tree would be listed as threatened because it could become endangered if things continue as they, as they are now. And so the California Fish and Game uh, Commission, just in August, uh, admitted that the Western Joshua tree would be accepted as a candidate species for listing. And so that's the decision before the California Fish and Game Commission right now is whether or not to accept the Western JT as a candidate species. The most important thing about this is that even in this candidate status, the Western Joshua tree has the full protection of the California Endangered Species Act. That is any development that would impact those species um, would have to uh, undertake uh, protective measures to avoid those or compensate for that uh, to the fullest extent possible. So let me see, somehow I've lost my screen. There we go, okay. So this is where the, um, the California Environmental Quality Act now comes to bear. And uh, without going into the more of the details of this CEQA process diagram. Um, we could spend a whole hour on that easily. Um, this is the, these are the rules of the game by which decisions are made uh, within the state of California, both local agencies, city, county, but also state agencies have to abide by the CEQA. And in particular, I would point to right here at the top of these uh, of the diagram where it says lead agency the lead agency prepares an initial study the initial study is kind of the scoping document that says okay what are the range of impacts that a proposed development could have on the environment and are those impacts significant or not and if they are significant, then they have to be more fully addressed in the form of an environmental impact report. And so this is a real critical stage where um, you, the concerned public, can weigh in on local decision makers. Some sort of county staff member or city staff member is going to go through this checklist and determine whether this is significant or not. And altogether, there are, um, you know, some 18 different issues that they might check uh, that, that uh, could be determined to be significant or, or insignificant issues. So, but the initial study is where you first have an opportunity to actually go before decision makers and testify at a public hearing and say, hey, I disagree with that. We have certain evidence that says that, in fact, this would potentially be a significant impact, and we think it needs more focus in the form of an environmental impact report. So I'll point out to you at the bottom of this slide that um, you can pull down these statutes and guidelines for the CEQA online here and review these at your leisure. It's very dry reading. It'll put you right to sleep. So um, within the initial study, is called uh, an environmental checklist. And this is just the scoping document that's prepared by the lead agency, the decision-making agency. And it evaluates these 18 some odd categories of potential environmental impacts. And they range, as you can see, from aesthetics to noise or air quality. There's biological resources, impacts on greenhouse gas emissions. That's a very significant one nowadays 
cultural resources, etc. At the very end of this environmental checklist is a category called mandatory findings of significance. And this is the point that I often go to when I'm working with local agencies regarding endangered species um, in particular. And so, and this is why this is a very um, crucial tool that we can play in terms of uh, decision making on local projects and developments is that the mandatory findings clause reads that if a project has the potential, even just the potential to substantially degrade the environment, et cetera, reduce the habitat of fish or wildlife species, reduce the number or restrict the range of a rare or endangered plant or animal. Reduce the number means minus one, okay? So if a project has the potential to reduce the number of a formally listed threatened or endangered species, then the lead agency must, mandatory, must prepare an EIR rather than what's called a negative declaration. That is, no problem, neg deck, everything's cool, we don't have to do an EIR, okay? Under the mandatory finding clause with endangered or threatened species, no can do. You can't do the neg deck. You have to do a formal EIR if they're going to bulldoze one Joshua tree, if we can get that listed. Okay, so, um, so this is a really important thing to point out to local decision makers, even if this is just a candidate species in the next year before the California Department of Fish and Wildlife actually makes their determination yay or nay on the threatened species status, this is still a candidate species in the meantime, and all of this CEQA stuff is applied. So here we have the Western Joshua tree petitioned as a candidate species for protection under the the California Endangered Species Act. So what that means is that um, if I go back through the petition process here, the, the center filed this petition in mid-October, as you saw. The California Fish and Game Commission, which is a, an appointed commission of various interest, interest groups appointed by the governor, and the Natural Resource Agency. So this includes hunters and uh, environmentalists and biologists and all kinds of other interest groups that might be uh, concerned with this. It also includes people from the development communities that uh, by somehow or other and some influence have gotten these positions on the Cal Fish and Game Commission. So they heard, they had a public hearing on the 20th of August, and they received testimony on the endangerment status of Western Joshua trees. This is more of the biological information that would support an endangered or threatened uh, definition under CESA. And, um, and so they took all that data and information and then they closed that public hearing on that portion of the hearing. So they're not likely to take more testimony at the upcoming hearing next week on the biological factors of endangerment. That is probably closed. But they will be having a public hearing this coming Tuesday um, on the 22nd. And in that hearing, they're going to hear uh, and receive testimony on what are called take exemptions. So to uh, under 
both federal and state endangered species act you can take an endangered species actually kill uh, or harm an individual of those endangered species only with very special circumstances and you have to have a permit to do that or that's a felony so it's not something that you just go out and and bulldoze or shoot a wolf or something i mean you you can't just do that willy-nilly so they're going to take um uh testimony on take exemptions and this is where we would like to weigh in on that and narrow the scope of potential take as much as we can um, and so in that i've included the link for how to get online and testify um, it will be at 8 30 on the second on tuesday that you can go online with this link and actually register to supply comments at the hearing so these are the kinds of take exemptions under section 2084 they're called of the california fish and game code our basic strategy is going to be to try to narrow these as much as possible not just leave it up to counties and cities to allow take for housing tracks that are in the review process while this petition is being considered um, we would like for the decision makers to be required to avoid joshua trees whenever possible so if at all possible avoid the really dense clusters of these by establishing open space or other things where avoidance is not completely possible then we would like to encourage that take may include transplantation that is they could move a joshua tree out of the roadway to project open space hopefully as near to the area where it's taken out as possible and i can speak to this in that in the mid to late 1980s while i was on the county planning commission um, we actually enacted a, a joshua tree ordinance that would require building contractors or or what have you to make joshua trees available for adoption to where we would actually take a hydraulic tree spade it's got four big hydraulic shovels if you will and we could lift a fully mature joshua tree 10 to 12 feet with some moderate branching out of the ground they've got fibrous roots like a palm tree so they transplant pretty easily actually and take that and move it tether it in its new home and uh, and they're pretty drought adapted so um, we had great success actually translocating joshua trees um, from roadways or building sites to designated open space areas so that would be one of the interim take exemptions that we would like to see required for all housing developments if they're already approved and ready to break ground they still would have to make every effort possible to move those trees out of harm's way and finally if they can't avoid trees at all and they can't um, relocate all of those we'd like for them also to consider land acquisition off-site for other habitat to compensate for that hopefully on a greater than one to one basis so if they're destroying one acre maybe they can protect five acres uh, next door of really good prime habitat or designate on-site open space or actual restoration of other areas that might have already been degraded say in a wildfire that killed a lot of joshua trees they could restore some of those joshua trees through translocation or other means so here we go so the california department of fish and wildlife if the California Fish and Game Commission, in fact, determines that the Western Joshua tree is appropriate, is an appropriate candidate for consideration as listing under as a threatened species, then the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, in charge of the regulatory agency, in charge of kind of overseeing the Endangered Species Act, will take this under review they'll review the, the data, the hard facts about endangerment, 
over the next year or so. And we anticipate final hearings then to go back before the Fish and Game Commission in late 2021 or early 2022 to where they will then consider all of the data, the recommendations of Cal Fish and Wildlife, and they'll make a final determination as to the appropriateness of listing the, the Western Joshua tree as a threatened, fully protected species under the California Endangered Species Act. Okay. In the meantime, in the meantime, as a candidate species, it has all of the protections under CESA that a fully endangered species does. So that's, that's what we're really shooting for at this meeting on the 22nd, is to ensure that the Fish and Game Commission lists this as a candidate species for listing. Okay, and so with that, I will um, turn this back over to Mariana and April, and I understand we're gonna do some breakout groups. Talk about specific things you might want to recommend or work through with elected officials in these next stages. And, so I, um, you've heard Tim talk about some of the transplanting experience um, that he's had. I also, um, when I worked for the National Park Service, transplanted Joshua trees. That was a big part of our um, project for a couple of years. And um, we also transplanted a lot at the Wildlands Conservancy after the Sawtooth Fire. And we had about a 95% success rate um, when done correctly to um, protocols about how to move them and to get the entire, you know, root ball and keep some of the soil and orient them the same direction, those sorts of things. So we're happy to follow up and, and talk more about this and Tim and others um, have some um, experts that can help people move Joshua trees or um, would be open to hiring, um, open for hire. So uh, any, any other burning questions that folks um, saw come in that we need to address? Now we should do a reminder about the, about the hearing as well. So we do have um, a question in the chat and there was another one earlier. I'm gonna try to, ah, yes, here we go. There's one earlier from Eric and Eric, uh, you're welcome to, um, to chime in on your own comment. Is there any documentation of the success of transplanting Joshua trees? I've been hearing that since they're so fragile, the success rate is actually quite low. Is it possible to get on that recipient list for adopting transplanted trees? So um, uh, success of transplanting Joshua trees and how to get on the adoption list. Tim, you want to take that? Go. So, um, I'm unaware of a quantitative uh, monitoring of the success and survival rate of Joshua trees. Like April, though, I've, my own experience has been very positive with them. And, and um, if it's done properly, clearly, if you just go out with a pick and shovel and try to move your own tree, that's not going to work. But but um, it has been, this has been done for 30 years now. So, and with the National Park and others that have done this kind of routinely, uh, when we have to move a tree out of harm's way, then we can do that. Um, so, uh, I don't know. It, I, I'd like to do a follow-up study of this in the next year. That might be something that I can get some students to take on and actually add some quantitative data to that. Yeah, I think that'd be great. And I think we could probably add the, uh, we had about 100 that we transplanted at Pioneer Town Mountains Preserve um, several years back. And then I can speak anecdotally about some of the success at Joshua National Park. And we could probably get some of the resources staff to weigh in on how those numbers look um, now. But very high success rate, again, when you follow kind of simple but specific protocols about how to move them. All right, great. Um, and yes, you can get on the adoption list uh, by contacting your local jurisdiction. So if it's Town of Yucca Valley, you can contact the Town of Yucca Valley, for example. Great. Um, and there was the comment um, from Casey Kiernan that the Joshua Tree Adoption Program is non-existent. Um, 
And then that, if, if it's reinstated. That's in yucca. Oh, that's in yucca. Okay. It, yeah. So yeah, yucca just has no program. And there's like, there's something, isn't it supposed to, you're supposed to list on the property a sign that says these, these uh, plants are available for adoption. No one's ever seen one. And, and I've been talking to people who have been here like 30 years. So it would be great to get it, get it going again. So. Yeah, that might be a follow-up for our reaching out to some local elected officials. Um, I can say that the Pioneer Town Mountains Preserve received some Joshua trees being on the donor list um, about 10, 15 years ago. Great. There's a couple hands up. Um, Frazier, and I can't see your first name, I'm sorry, A. Gertz. So I think um, since Frazier is on our board, Arch. I'll start with uh, I'll start with Mr. A. Gertz. Need to unmute. Yeah, if you had your oh, hand okay. up, you want. Oh, we hear you. There you go. Well, how are we doing now? Go. Yep. Can we hear me now? Yep. Great. Okay, what I think I gleaned from uh, Dr. Kranz's presentation, uh, as far as I can tell, we have missed a threatened species in the Sultan Sea Basin. And this species happens to occupy, at least currently, the top of the food chain, who inadvertently decides uh, all the other species how they live or die. And that species is the human beings attempting to live their lives uh, healthily in the Salton Sea Basin. And they're not on the uh, threatened list. They should be. Uh, their lives and health and quality of life is suffering needlessly. And perhaps if they were added to the threatened species list, we might actually see some beneficial action in the Salton Sea Basin. Um, well, uh, Mr. Gertz, I, I would agree with you that in fact, uh, we hominids in the Salton Basin are certainly threatened. And um, I, I would just say that uh, as an aside, I was the Salton Sea Database Program Director for 20 years and I've, I've uh, really watched that very closely. Um, that's a whole nother issue. But uh, yeah, I, I don't know what to say about that, but that, that really doesn't pertain to Joshua trees. They used to be down in the Salton Basin back during the ice ages, but they're not there now. All right. Thank and you. Frazier, you have your hand up as well. And uh, the, I just wanted to carry forward Ben's question uh, from earlier, and uh, we already got an answer, or, or Eric's rather, so. Uh, it's all good. Okay, with that, um, I'm not seeing anything else in um, the... I wanted, Mariana, I wanted to ask, uh, have uh, Dr. Kranz say, uh, what is the staff report recommendation right now for the Joshua Tree and how, um, how uh, much weight is that uh, for the commissioner's decision? I, I believe the Cal Fish and Wildlife staff report and the commission staff report was in favor of the candidate, candidacy. So they're in favor, and that's supposed to be based on evidence, not just the input from the other constituencies or lobbies, but um, on the hard biological evidence of endangerment or not. And so their recommendation was that the Western Joshua Tree does deserve to be considered as a candidate species for threatened status. That would then kick this off into the next year's review for Cal Fish and Wildlife to review the data. So we have, an, and in that period, we have more time to submit more data. So, um, but their, their general recommendation has been favorable. So I, I think they need to be as I mentioned in my breakout group, we wanna thank the, the Fish and Game Commission. First thing when we make our comments, thank them for receiving our comments and thank them for their acceptance of the candidacy 
of the Joshua tree as a threatened species. Okay. Um, that is Richard. all the questions that we have, and it is seven o'clock. So I'm uh, I'm sure that folks that there are some folks that still want to talk, but um, we do have to be mindful of everyone's time and want to thank everyone and wrap up. So I'm going to share my screen just briefly um, while April closes us, or sorry, I think Fraser is going to close us out tonight. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And then just wanted to give a, on behalf of the California Desert Coalition and our board of directors to thank everybody for attending tonight. Um, encourage everybody, A, to comment. If you're going to comment in writing, comment by noon tomorrow to the Fish and Game Commission or go online uh, on the 22nd and comment in person about the take exemptions as we've outlined tonight. I want to thank our speakers, Chris and Tim, uh, for hopping on and giving us their time and their expertise tonight. Wish everybody well uh, with, the, with the fires and the smoke that the state and Southern California is experiencing right now. And as always, uh, we appreciate any support that any of you can provide to the California Desert Coalition. We have no paid staff. This is 100% volunteer effort. So you can be assured that every dollar you donate is 100% dedicated to programs like this and uh, advocating for issues that protect the California desert. We are a 501c3. And as April mentioned earlier, we're just getting ready to roll out a new website. Uh, there'll be more resources there. Uh, in the next few days related to this and other issues. So with that, uh, thank you all again for coming and we look forward to doing this all over again soon and someday in person. <laughs>